morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and welcome to this uh, webinar session. I'm Tony Schoenenberger, I'm the executive chairman of STARS. STARS is actually a global platform for dialogue to discuss developments which will impact the society as a whole, and particularly also our businesses in the next uh, couple of years. In the STARS webinars, we are covering China at some length. At the same time, we also focus on the United States, which is clearly number one, geopolitically and economically speaking. And our webinar series is called the US in a emerging multipolar world. So today we have the privilege to talk to Mona Satfen. Mona, it's really great to have you again on a STARS event. Mona, I, uh, I think there is no need to say, but she is really an outstanding expert on uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, developments, and particularly also on the risks for international companies. Uh, I should also mention that Mona Satfan is a member of the STARS International Board. So Mona, again, great to have you on this webinar. We very much look forward to your insights. At this time, in at this point in time, I also want to introduce uh, uh, to you to our moderator, to Mark uh, Ditley. He is the CEO and editor of the Market, the leading digital business and finance platform in Switzerland. Mark is going to moderate all the webinars on the US. So again, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much, uh, Mona, for being with us, for taking the time. Um, just an invitation to the audience. Uh, you can type in your questions whenever you want. Please use the F&A, the Q&A um, uh, 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 format, and I will try and weave in the questions wherever they fit. Uh, now, Mona, when we talk about geopolitics, we, we have to start with the US-China relation uh, and the deterioration really of that relationship that has been going on over, over a number of years already. And of course, we've had the unfortunate balloon incident in February and one just gets the picture that it's kind of a slippery slope down. Give us first, give us your Bert's eyes view of where does the US-China relationship stand today and how will it evolve going forward? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for, for uh, interviewing me. It's great to be with everybody again today. Um, yeah, the US-China relationship. Um, no question that it's it's hard to see uh, glimmers of positivity in the bilateral relationship at this moment in time. Um, and we've had periods, as you've you've said, over the past actually decade or so, if not more, I would say a steady overall deterioration in the relationship with punctuated by times, though, where there feels like there's a little bit of an opportunity for collaboration and to level set, balance things out. That's part of the reason why the balloon incident was so unfortunate, because it did feel in the lead up to that moment that both Beijing and Washington don't really want to really confront each other in an intense way, um, despite our scratchy relationship. And as um, you well know, even in the transatlantic relationship, we can have a very scratchy relationship with some of our some of our partners and allies. Um, but the net negative is kind of where we're headed. And I don't see, unfortunately, a change in that overall trajectory. But that doesn't mean that we're going to war or anything like that. So I think that's a little that's that's I, I hear lots of people assuming that that's the case. I don't I don't believe that that's the case. We've had in Beijing last week, the two sessions um, uh, of the National People's uh, Congress being one of them where both Xi Jinping and the new foreign minister of China have used very harsh rhetorics uh, versus the United States. How did you read the rhetorics that we got from Beijing last week? Yeah, so I would say to me that was a signal of um, mutual uh, distrust and some of the policy steps that the U.S. has taken that um, have a direct uh, impact on uh, on the Chinese economy and Chinese goals in the in the global economy. And so 
as the U.S. takes steps, things like semiconductors, what's going on with TikTok, there are lots of places where if you're sitting in China, you feel like um, the United States is trying to contain you. And of course, if you're sitting in the U.S., you're trying to protect your, your market and market share, right? So it's in the eye of the beholder at this point. Um, so it was definitely noted and the intensity of it and coming from Xi in particular, personally, um, but what to me that that signals is that it is registered that this is um, we are in a in a, a kind of uh, confrontational mode um, at this point in the relationship. I don't know that that's that's so unhealthy to be honest because that's the reality of it. I think people have been hesitant to call it what it is, but that is the case. Now, what's your assessment of the the U.S. domestic? Um... Uh, politics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. One gets the impression that both Republicans and Democrats, they really have to outdo themselves and sort of the, the other party in being hard uh, towards China. It's it's almost like the only issue that there's a bipartisan agreement is that you cannot be hard enough on China. I'd say that is true. And as we know, it is very hard to come by bipartisan issues today in Washington, D.C., but this seems to be one of them. And I would say it's because for the last, uh, I would say 30, 25 years, what I've observed is that the natural constituencies that were previously pro-China have fallen by the wayside. So obviously, if you're in the democracy, human rights, that crowd fell away from China long ago, right? The defense community has always been quite skeptical of, of China and China's rise. So the one community that was actually holding up the bipartisan, uh, the, the bilateral relationship was the business community. Um, for years and years, the idea that it would be a collaborative open market. And I remember I was working in the White House when we, when we, uh, when China entered the WTO and the U.S. was negotiating its first economic access uh, in, in depth in China, the excitement among the business community was through the roof. But over the years, you've seen that excitement wane and, and de deteriorate decline further and further. And at this point, I would say it's 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 very few and far between business leaders that you find that are full-throated, uh, very excited about the about China, about their business prospects there. So as that's fallen by the wayside, there's really not anybody in the stakeholder class that's a that's cheerleading for the bilateral relationship. And you need that in the United States. That's what keeps bilateral relations um you know, engaged and, and in a positive keel. Given that situation, what does that mean for businesses? I mean, there's been a lot of talk. One could read a lot about the the fragmentation of the world economy, the reshoring of production capacities and so on. Do you see that happening on the ground in reality? Are these two major economies, the two largest economies of the work of the world, are growing apart and being uh, ripped apart, really. Yeah, ripped apart, really. Yeah, I've, I feel for uh, companies that built their business at that supply chain intersection with the assumption that we would have a globally integrated economy. I don't, I don't know that it's just U.S. and China. I mean, I feel like we've been moving, um, as I used to call the archipelago world. We've been drifting apart for for many years. The, the pandemic accelerated that because people went from a just-in-time mindset to having wanting more resilience in their supply chains. And some of that's obviously the pandemic and the bilateral relationship, but it's also uh, just the, the climate change and some of the natural um, challenges that you have in making sure that you can get your goods and supplies where you need them at the time that you need them. So some of it I, I see is actually not a net negative. It's just in reaction to uh, the risks that are out there that are beyond the geopolitical ones. Um, but there is no question that for the what I might call the industries of the future, so the ones that you want to win in, those very cutting edge to so think, you know, AI, robotics, um, biotech, semiconductors, that there is a light nationalist. I would say that the West, uh, you're, you see this the same with um, energy uh, related technology in Europe, um, trying to go a little toe to toe with the Chinese who've always had a national industry mindset uh, when it comes to their industrial policy. And so you see a light version of that emerging in the United States, and I suspect you're going to see it in Europe as well. Would you characterize the, the relationship or the confrontation really between the US and China as a new Cold War? I wouldn't go as far to say that it's a Cold War yet. 
because there's actually still a lot of collaboration in a lot of ways. The Cold War was was quite, I mean, people had to pick sides. There's very little direct interaction um, on almost every level, whether it was academic, social, certainly economic defense. We were at loggerheads. And, and again, other countries were forced to uh, pick sides. I don't think we're there yet. I understand why people say that we're headed in that direction. And if you told me five, 10 years from now, would we, could we emerge in a, in a place where it feels like it's another Cold War? Absolutely. But I don't think that that's a foregone conclusion. Um, part of it is because our, our economies, they're very intertwined. Um, so I see we're in a space that's a, a, a little bit like the US-Japan relationship in the 1990s, where it got very, very contentious, as you recall. Um, we, had the, we did not have the, the same defense kind of geopolitical uh, tensions, but on the economic side, it, it feels more similar to that um, than, the, than the Russian, you know, than the Cold War of the 70s and 80s. Um, in, the, in the field of semiconduct, uh, semiconductors, for example, the U.S. has basically pressured both the Netherlands and Japan to also join their sanctions against the Chinese. And uh, I've talked to our friend Jörg Wutke in Beijing uh, last week, and he said there will come a point where Washington will tell the Europeans or will ask them, are you with us or against us? Basically, mm -hmm. there's no in between anymore. You're either with us or with them. Do you see that happening? I could see a situation on certain kinds of sensitive technologies like that. It's not so much, are you with us, are you with them? It's more, do you really want to build up two systems that are, then have to live together? And do you, so you could see a bifurcated world where Europe it, it can't integrate easily US and China. So as a practical matter, it makes it very difficult. If you want to sell, for example, goods and services into the United States, you're going to have to use semiconductors that we've approved. So you're going to have two manufacturing facilities, one with China that's focused with Chinese uh, market access and another one's the U.S. Like as a practical matter, that's the market leverage that the U.S. probably will end up using. You're already seeing that in a, in a variety of ways. Um, and that's been the case, by the way, for, for some time. It's just semiconductors are a particular flashpoint because they're so critical, obviously. So. Do you see, apart from semiconductors, do you see other flashpoints coming up? Uh, in yeah. terms of of products or technologies, and which would yeah. which would those be? Yeah, so I see a lot in the biotech space. These are both the feeder uh, elements that you need in in biotech development, um, for sure. I see it in the clean energy space, both the actual inputs as well as the technologies associated with the energy transition. Um, as you know, with the passage of the IRA even in Europe, right, there's a lot of alarm about how much of an industrial policy that feels like, and it, it does definitely have the, those elements to it, um, that's going to have a natural pulling effect, right, of activity uh, toward the U.S. if you want to have access to the U.S. market, and, you know, most global players still do, and the U.S. market is still the most open. Even with these um, restrictions, the U.S. economy is still significantly more open than, than many other places, so... Now, given the, the contentious relationship between the U.S. and China, obvious, the obvious flashpoint is Taiwan. Uh, and have a, I have a question from the audience here. I quote, uh, Kevin Rudd, in his recent book, The Avoidable War, has suggested that the U.S. and China should agree on a friendly competition with clear red lines defined, such as no forceful invasion of Taiwan and no recognition of Taiwan's independence. Mm -hmm. Is this a workable model to manage the Chinese challenge to the West? So um, potentially, yes. Um, so I'd say that the interesting thing with the U.S.-China uh, relationship vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan is that we lived in a period of strategic ambiguity, and that was a safe place to be. Um, both sides had rough understandings, not ever really articulated, about what the boundaries were. And that felt like it was stable, although ambiguous and um, a little bit gray area. But as the relationship has become more contentious, I do think there's a lot of uh, momentum and desire really on both sides to have a clear understanding of whose red lines are what and where. Um, and I, I, getting to that point is is always the challenge. It's a little bit like you can always see the end game, what the end solution might be. The, the challenge is actually getting to the point where everybody could have that conversation. 
Um, I don't, I'm not one of these people who believes that we're automatically going to war in Taiwan or that the Chinese actually want to, um, you know, violently overthrow the Taiwanese government. Like that's, to me, those are outlier scenarios at this point. So we have some time. It, it seems to me that lately it was actually Taipei that tried to calm down nerves a bit with uh, President Tsai Ing-wen saying, um, I'll come to the U.S. and meet Kevin McCarthy and don't come Rather to me. Than, right, so, exactly. Let's not have this again, because the Pelosi visit obviously had uh, quite a reaction in Beijing. And I don't, I, I actually don't think any of the parties involved, Taiwan most of all, but certainly the U.S. or China really want to go to head, head to head in a hot war in Taiwan. Like that's not in anybody's strategic interest. That may change down the line. I just don't see it today. But that modus operandi that we had for 40 plus years, that strategic ambiguity, which basically meant the US accepts the one China idea, the US does not encourage Taiwan independence, um, and China doesn't make a forceful move to take Taiwan. Does that modus operandi, does that still work? I mean, can we still build on that for the years to come? I think we can, because I think the alternatives, when you start to think, okay, well, if, if not this, then what? All the alternative scenarios get you in a, in a, I would say, more unstable place than that basic formula. The question, I think, is as, Ch as China's ambitions have grown and their footprint has grown across Asia, this isn't just Taiwan, but certainly includes Taiwan, um, clearer articulation of what is a red line at what point does, is, is there a feeling? We always sold, sold, for example, weapon systems to Taiwan. That has become something much more of a flashpoint than it was, but we've, the US has been doing it for a very long time and the Chinese would typically turn the other cheek. So is that in or out, right? So there are things that we both, both sides have been doing for many, many years that now through the lens of our current bilateral relationship feel aggressive, even though technically they really were things that we were doing before, right? So that's why I say like, when you, when you start to define those spaces, that's where things get quite contentious. Getting to the point where we have enough of a relationship where we can have that dialogue, I think is, is still some years to come. On that topic, also a question from the audience, uh, which concerns the AUKUS uh, agreement with Australia, the US and the UK. They have met recently in San Diego to advance the project. Is it conceivable that AUKUS will someday include the likes of France, Canada, Japan, South Korea, uh, New Zealand? Do you see that happening? So kind of that is growing almost into a NATO-like structure in the Asia Pacific? I could see it. Uh, I'm not sure all of those countries. I don't necessarily see why the uh, Germans or the you know continental Europeans necessarily would want to get in the middle of that. But the idea that New Zealand might or South Korea might seems within the realm of, of possibility if the relationship um, becomes something. And as you know, like those countries have also collaborated with NATO, even though they're not NATO, direct NATO members, but in the case of Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera, they've, they've done collaborations together. So I don't know that you necessarily have to have a formal kind of treaty along the lines of NATO in order for it to have the deterrent effect that obviously it's, it's designed to have. And in this day and age, I'm not sure that there's a lot of benefit to going all the way down to a formal treaty, uh, as long as people understand what the expectations are of the partnership. And I could see exercises together, all kinds of collaboration together and stopping short of needing a, an actual treaty. Let's move to the uh, to Russia and the, the war in, in Ukraine. Um, I remember when you were in Switzerland in September, you were at the time somewhat optimistic that we might have a ceasefire and they start they start of a process of negotiation soon um what happened to that i know i know it's so unfortunate so as i think i said there's wars have a tendency to have they, they have a, a momentum to them and there's the ebb and the flow and you can see it in the press who has the slight advantage on the ground who has the advantage in the diplomacy how the various uh actors are reacting to each other to, to developments um, and I, you, it has to come together where both sides look over the precipice and say, mm, I think I've got about the best hand I've got right now. That's how you get, that's how you, everybody pulls everybody back. Right. And so you've been able to see underneath through the news, the U S kind of 
both nudging and encouraging, trying to open the room for dialogue, trying to figure out what would those common threads be, you know, have the Chinese jumping into it as well. But you can see this in the dynamic, for example, with the uh, the French and the Russians and the US, everybody kind of circling around each other. On the one hand, um, not wanting to let off the gas when it comes to support for Ukraine. On the other hand, trying to figure out what is that landing zone? Like at what point could there be interest in having uh, further dialogue? Um, I think the gating issue uh, has been and continues to be what Putin's ultimate goals are. I think if you're in, in his shoes, you probably think uh, time is on your side. Um, and I don't know that because of the way the war has been postured in Russia, that there's an easy landing point. Um, and I just don't know that it's necessarily in his, in his DNA. And so um, I think obviously he was hoping that maybe the European energy crisis in the winter would create an opening for more negotiation, more pressure on the Ukrainians. That hasn't happened. That's actually what I thought as well, that that would be something that would kind of push everybody to a conclusion. Um, now that people are gearing up for the spring offensive, you've got another question, which is, okay, are we going to take the next leg down or are we going to bring this to, to a, a, a negotiated settlement, right? Wars end through negotiation. So eventually there has to be something. And so um, I'm seeing lots of ideas, lots of people with different ideas. But again, it's, you know, the Ukrainians um, are going to be dragged kicking and screaming to any negotiation, right? And obviously they have to have a, they have to have somebody to do a, to have a negotiation with. Um, so I think it's still a ways off, unfortunately. I have a question on that from the audience as well. I quote again, tragically, the Ukraine war will likely grind on until the limited economic capacity of Russia and its allies can no longer and its allies can no longer provide weapons of the quality and the quantity that the West can pro uh, provide to the Ukrainian forces. How might the West encourage China not to provide support for Russia? Yeah, so the Chinese, I mean, it's been very interesting to watch. As you see, they're on a diplomatic tear. They did their diplomacy in the Middle East, and now they're they're angling around um, you know, this this conflict. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, by the way. And some of my US colleagues are always looking at that thinking, mm, I mean, you can't have it both ways, right? The US has complained for years that there isn't enough, that the US is the only one rowing the boat when it comes to these big, complicated, multinational problems. Um, and having the Chinese uh, understand that they have strategic interests at play is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think the, for, the, for the Chinese, the big question is, is it um, they're very tactical, I think, when it comes to the relationship vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Um, and if they feel like it's coming at a big cost to them, then maybe it's not worth doing. Right now, there hasn't been a lot of cost. And so this just goes to resolve of the West, right? How far, I guess, from, from my perspective, I always say that as one of my colleagues would say, the people in the West won't use the W word when it comes to Ukraine, right? They don't won't say that that Ukraine should win. They'll say Russia should be defeated, that Russia needs to get rolled back, but they won't use the W word. And so there's always a hesitation to get deeper involved. So we're in the slippery slope of making it worse, but it's always reactive, right? It's not, there's no, there's no end game here that brings it to a natural conclusion. And I think that's um the Chinese know that. So they can they can play for time for a little bit because they know that the West doesn't really want to escalate to the logical. If you take this to the logical extreme, we would be in a much bigger head to head conflict. And I, I don't think the Chinese would be interested in engaging in a conflict on European soil, backing the Russians against Western Europe like that is not in their interest at all whatsoever. Eventually, my my view is that the European um because of the Chinese economy and their interest in making the relationship with Europe a little bit more stable and having access to those markets. That's actually a linchpin. It's less about the US and it's more about um, European attitudes related to China, as I suspect what they're more sensitive about. Uh, on the topic of the Chinese diplomatic muscle, uh, we've had this uh, coup, one could say, that they got uh, the Saudis and the Iranians to um, establish relationships again. What did you make of that? Was that more than just a PR coup? Or, or how did the US foreign policy establishment react to that? Yeah. So uh, one, I mean, people were aware of the talks, so it's not like it was totally out of the blue. I mean, people, everybody knows what everybody's doing right in the region. It's very hard to keep anything secret. Um, 
And I'd say there's a mixed attitude. So again, there are some people who still have a view that the United States should be everywhere and engaged in all places and the pole position, and it's either our idea or no idea. I'm more in the, I'd say there's a pragmatic camp, which I'm in, which is that um, people in the region see some of it's the US energy production, some of it's just US interest in the region after several wars over 20 years that the US appetite to engage in the region in the, at the kind of level that it needs in order to keep things from going sideways has, um, has just waned in the United States, right? The appetite to engage in the region has just gone down. And if you live in the region, you can feel that and you can see that in terms of time and attention and focus, right? The focus in US, in US foreign policy has moved to China, right? I mean, everybody's talking about that. Just so, if you're sitting in the region and the, the Chinese obviously have a material direct strategic interest um, in, in making sure that this works out. I mean, that, that people aren't going to war. So I think it's actually not the end of the world. I mean, I, I think peace and having people, hopefully it means the end of the war in Yemen, which the U S has tried for years to get to wind down unsuccessfully. So if it leads to that, then, you know, it'd be okay. I'm a little skeptical that it lasts, but you never know. We have a few more minutes left, and obviously we have to talk about 2024, November oh, yeah. 2024, and the U.S. <laughs> elections. Um, I can well imagine that Vladimir Putin thinks the U.S. will be vastly different than what it is today after November 2024. Um, looking at what Ron DeSantis is saying, what Donald Trump obviously is saying, um, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to predict what the election outcome will be, yeah. but um, there's the p potential that the U.S. government will be completely different. A new Republican government would be mm -hmm. something that we haven't seen actually before. What's your take on that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting if you recall going back to the Ukraine uh, situation back before the, the war, this part of the war, um, one of the few um, veto-proof uh, votes was actually related to Ukraine. So is this deeper than just who controls the White House? It goes to the composition of Congress, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very hard to predict, I think, where the war will be by then and then what happens politically. Right now, there's a commanding majority, bipartisan majority in favor of continuing the status quo. Maybe that changes because things develop or you know the dynamics change or the perceived cost goes up. Um, but I, I, I don't, I can't predict that that's the case. And so I think it's a strategic gamble on the part of Putin to assume that just because it could end up being a Republican governor, it could end up at government, it can end up being a Democratic one. It's going to be a very tightly contested uh, contest. Um, the House is right on the margin. The Senate's right on the margin. So it could go either way. Both have, it's going to be a complicated cycle for sure. So um, if I were him, I wouldn't want to predict that. If you know what I mean? That's not a, that's not a good bet. There's a scenario out there that the U.S. economy at some point in the next 18 months will fall into a recession, mm -hmm. which usually usually is not good for the incumbent. Uh, so the, the scenario would be recession and Donald Trump will sail back into the White House. Yeah, well, I do think Donald Trump has a decent shot of winning the presidency again. So I think anybody who thinks that that's not possible, and I have lots of friends and colleagues who Republican and Democrat who say, oh, it's not possible. It's not, po they say that because they don't want to conceive of the fact of that possibility, but it is possible. Um, I think it's not likely because he engenders such a strong reaction from Democrats and other people. You saw this in the midterm elections, even there's a very, very strong um, impulse uh, that you, that, Politicians don't even need to animate among the voting base to get in response to Donald Trump. So I I worry about it, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. But I also don't think you can rest assured and rest easy either. Um, so I think it's wide open. I mean, I think the Republican field will see how it shapes up. Like it's it's way way early to tell. Ultimately, same on the Democratic side. I mean, people are assuming Biden runs, which is my my assumption as well. But I wouldn't say it's a foregone conclusion until you pull the trigger and you're doing it, you're not doing it, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's we have to see how the field shapes up. Yes, what happens with the economy? What happens with the war? What happens with some other dynamics? So um, obviously Democrats start off with an edge in the electoral college. So the, the swing states are gonna be even fewer this time around, maybe four of them, so. Do you see, do you still see the potential for a, let's call it a bargain that Donald Trump will not be indicted, but he will kind of fade 
I think that was something that you mentioned in September, kind of, you know, he will step back, but there will not be any legal uh, legal uh, issue for him. Yeah, the problem is, is that now his biggest legal jeopardy is actually at the states, so state level, and states don't have any control over, I mean, the states can do what the states want to do from an indictment perspective. So he may be indicted as early as next week in New York, and then later in Georgia. So and the federal government can't do anything about that because those legal proceedings go on independently. So I, I do think that um, there are lots of people saying that if he's not the nominee of the Republican Party, then he just walks away and trashes the entire contest, which would help Democrats. I'm not sure I see that because there is a special prosecutor looking at Donald Trump at the federal, at the national level as well. Right. So that that's a risk for him. So I still think that's in his in his context. Right. Which is, do I really want to have yet another legal battle that's at even more higher consequence uh, than the couple of ones that are going on at the state level? And so um, so I do think that's a factor down the line. But I think he's now that he's in it, I think he wants to win it because that's that's kind of what starts to happen in your mind. And you think, well, I'm better than everybody else. So, of course, I should win. Right. So we'll see. Uh, Mona, we have to wrap it up here, but allow la uh, one last question: sure. Will Joe Bi will Joe Biden run again? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, all the, it it looks like he's going to run, but I've been around this a lot, um, and you're not running until you're running, right? And so, I think lots of people would have thought he would announce in December, and then after the State of the Union, and now all of a sudden it's the end of March, and so. The longer you go, the more it makes you wonder if there's something, if there are hesitations underneath. And obviously, Democratic voters, uh, the majority of them, think it's not a good idea for him to run. So I suspect that's why there's a little bit of hesitation, is they're looking at those numbers and thinking, OK, um, he could probably prevail against Donald Trump, but what if it's not Donald Trump, right? So that's kind of what's going on in people's minds. Um, but I suspect in the end, he probably does run. Uh, but I would say it's not, I'm, I'm not in the 100% mode. I'm more in the, you know, 65, 70% mode. So. Okay. We, we have to come to a close here. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mona, for being with us. Uh, to the audience, I know there were a couple of questions that I could not take anymore, but they, they didn't, they just didn't fit into the conversation. So thanks for being with us, Mona. Yeah, and uh, to me. all of, to all of you in the audience, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining and uh, looking forward to the next round of these talks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Take care. See you Take soon. Care. Bye.